question. Again, thank you everyone for just hopping on this call on time and being a part of the careers conversations tonight. Um, my name is Ross Thompson. I'm a graduating senior finance major from Houston, Texas, and I'm currently the president of the Morehouse Business Association. We're very excited to welcome you to the second session of our Career Conversation Speaker Series with AUC alumni. We created this series this semester to talk to different business minds who have graduated from the AUC and use these conversations as an opportunity to get insight on different career paths and learn what it's like to work in these industries that we as students aspire to be in one day. I'm excited to announce that Ernest Holmes will be our guest for tonight's session in our Careers Conversation. Ernest is a Morehouse graduate of the class of 2019 and he was a math and computer science double major. During his time at Morehouse, he became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. He interned at Google for three summers and co-founded a nonprofit organization in Codehouse. Following graduate, graduation, Ernest went on to work full-time at Google as a software engineer, and he continues to work at Codehouse part-time. Codehouse is a nonprofit organization that focuses on cultivating a strong pipeline between students of color and industry-leading technology companies. At its core, Codehouse aims to tackle the diversity gap in technology by providing exposure and resources to enhance students' technical skills, promoting internship and full-time placement, while elevating the next generation of diverse leaders in technology. So without further ado, can everyone please welcome Ernest Holmes. <laughs> and I'm sure if this was in person, you'd hear a very loud round of applause, <laughs> but <laughs> we can just imagine it virtually. So yeah, no, thank, thank you, Ernest, for getting on this call today. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, the pleasure is all mine. All right, great. So we can just go ahead and dive into this conversation. Um, the mission of Code House, it seems something um, very personable and something that the creator would have to relate to in order of starting it. Um, so can you just walk us through your thought process of um, sort of what motivated you to create Code House? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's a lot of things fell in place at the right time. Uh, I am in school since my freshman year at Morehouse. So I was there forever. And because of that, I was asked to do a lot of talks at middle schools, high schools, elementary schools about what it's like being a tech professional, but being a black man in tech as well, right? So being a guiding light or like a guiding figure for these students, myself, along with like Tavis Thompson and some other students like Julian Parker and, and uh, Lonnie Breen, like we all had some ideas of putting together an event to um, expand or scale out the impact we've been having, talking about the tech industry and like showing it to students, primarily in K through 12. And that's where the first event really came to play. So we made Tech Exposure Day, the students got to experience all these tech companies, but then also a design thinking workshop and really get to connect with AUC students. So we had 150 students that first year Nine companies came out, Google, Microsoft, Dell, IBM, a lot of the big ones. They had the swag to give out to kids and they had you know, cool live demos. And once we realized that this model of showing students, people in tech, more importantly, people that look like in tech was actually impactful and actually beneficial to them, not only from hearing it from them directly, but not the, um, the teachers and educators who came on the trip as well, we realized that we had a good model for bringing that level of engagement exposure to the tech industry that we wanted. And that's how Codehouse really first began and first got started. No, that, that's, that, that's great. You touched um, in that a little bit on how when you first wanted to create it, you just wanted to find something at scale to reach a, a good amount of students and spread this information. Um, so I know Codehouse is a relatively young organization, but when you were first starting, can you speak on um, just what your ultimate goal of like finding or starting this organization was? And um, since then, have you been able to like measure your impact of success um, in achieving that goal? Yeah, I mean, it really just started with that, giving that level of exposure to students who normally don't get to, right? So mm -hmm. we're talking about students from like, you know, Atlanta for real, you know, from these different uh, uh, schools around the the area from of, of the AUC who don't normally get to connect to pro professionals in this world, um, in the tech profession, um, but more importantly, people that look like them, right? So that level of engagement and exposure was really critical to a lot of their matriculations. And we're still hearing results from those students like to this day, um, like like hearing tangible results from our first events of students wanting to come to HBCUs one, because they realized that HBCUs is where it's at, but then two, wanting to come into tech because money, opportunities, amount of influence and power that you have making these technical um, solutions, impacting billions of lives across the world, like there's nothing like it, right? So the students have been getting excited about, about all of that. Um, so since the first event, we made into a 501c3 nonprofit, have a board of directors and everything. 
back in last February, we had the second Tech Exposure Day event where we had 400 students come out. So larger scale, gave out like 20 laptops that, that day and like an Xbox to make it even more exciting for the kids and like some Google speakers. Um, and then we also included the admissions teams into this event. So like they actually got to connect with admissions officers from the AUC to talk about what it takes to apply to, um, to college and the importance of HBCUs. Another cool spin on it was that we had current HBCU students from the AUC talk to them um, to hear from like data in real life, like, well, what is it like going to college? What's like going to HBCU pros, cons and all that. Um, and now we're at the point where, honestly, this is expanding a lot quicker than I thought. Um, and we re really had to hone in and figure out what problem we were solving. When we talk about the tech diversity pipeline, there's tons of issues, right? It's, it's a systemic issue. People, companies are finally just starting to realize that you, you can't just show up at Morehouse and recruit 100 black people and now you guys are diverse. Like that, it's not the way it works. That there's issues in K to 12, in higher education, in uh, corporate America, of course, you know, matriculating up into higher um, professions. And there's gonna, there's, a lot of work that needs to be done. So we at Code House specifically are taking that gap between K-12 and higher education to fix and tailor solutions to those issues um, within that gap, um, which is a really cool thing to do because we touch on the higher education's point of view with HBCUs, we touch on the K-12 point of view with primarily high schools and some middle schools. Um, so there's just a lot of networking and community that's being built on, on that pivot point. Um, and now we just actually just launched on Monday, um, the third Tech Exposure Day event that's happening in, on November 12th. And that's actually going to be for students across the nation. So since it's virtual, we're like, might as well go big or go home. Um, and we started working a few months ago with school districts in Atlanta, DC, Jersey, New York, Chicago, Oakland, Seattle, um, to bring students of color across the nation to hear from these tech leaders and tech professionals, but then also HBCUs to talk about these connections and then we have organizations like Black Girls Code and Girls Who Code also participating. So it's cool to, like just to like reflect right now and see like we went from 150 to 400 to like 10,000 and like that's the scale and impact that I've been wanting to have so it's cool to see it actually come to fruition. And of course we have some other programs on the way as well. So I don't know if that answered your question but <laughs> that's all. It definitely did and I, I just say um, good luck and congrats on this upcoming event and um, also congrats on just that rapid growth of how you've been able to scale Code House. Um, that's amazing to be able to scale it at that rate. Um, so saying that, I know you've had a lot of success in the past couple of years um, or short years that you've had with Code House. Can you just touch on some of the challenges that you experienced, um, not only being an entrepreneur, but also just starting this venture while in college? Yeah, um, I would say the biggest, I guess, like challenge that we had was convincing companies that they needed to invest in black and brown students earlier than they were, right? So like I said, like a lot of companies had this aha moment. We have no black people in my company. Let's go to Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, you know, uh, Hampton, Howard, and like that's gonna fix the problems. And then they get there and they're like, oh, you guys only have one engineer here that we can hire. You only have like three business majors or what, what, what have you. And um, trying to convince them that like they need to start investing in these students' lives at an earlier age, meaning in K through 12, it was, it's a hard sell sometimes, right? Because companies like to see return on investment. Like, what's my ROI? Like, if I if they give ten thousand dollars for eighth graders, like, what do they get out of that other than like good publicity, right? Um, but so trying to convince them to be like, this is something that's needed and is very like is going to change a lot of lives was like the first problem. And it seems easier after like once one company comes in, but at first it was just like people were like, okay, I guess like we can go, but we can't give you any money, and it's like no. We need money, we need representation, we need prizes, we need all like, you know, X, Y, and Z and A, B, and C. Um, and companies are just finally starting to realize that right now. So like we had like a funding goal for this event coming up and we actually doubled it because people were like, okay, you know, especially with everything going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, they were like finally, finally realizing that they need to invest a lot more money into uh, the black and brown community, you know? So I would say that's probably the main <laughs> challenge but the other one is really just uh, maintaining everything that's happening with the scale that we're growing into um, mm -hmm. like you know going from a, a few hundred to multiple thousand it's just there's probably not an organization 
I, I'm talking like boastfully, but like there's a lot of companies, organizations, um, government uh, departments that I've been in contact with now just because of the work that we're doing, which is super cool, right? Like my network is fantastic now. If I need someone in a certain area, I have someone that I can email or text or call. Um, but just maintaining that while doing a full-time job, which I'm sure we're going to talk about a little later. It's just, it's a lot, it's a lot, but it's fun. Um, and it's definitely exciting to see the impact that we're going to have on these students' lives. Yeah, no, I'm definitely excited to see just the future of Code House and how much further y'all can grow as well. Um, so in that, well, earlier you touched on how now um, you're having your next um, event will be a virtual event, um, obviously due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there's lately a lot of entrepreneurs have been having to pivot or change their business models because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, is there any other ways that you've had to adjust or adapt some of your ventures because of this? You know, since we've really been strong on that one event, it's been, that had its own challenges within itself. It's, um, you know, obviously there's pros and cons. Pros expand to a limit that we didn't think we'll be able to expand to this quickly, but con is like, you still get a lack of sense of community when everything's digital and online. Like, my heart is out to all you guys still going to school right now, because I, I have my own challenges at work. <laughs> I can't imagine trying to learn. Like, I would have no motivation um, right now. So shout out to you guys and shout out to the seniors that are graduating this year. Um, we have another initiative that we're keeping kind of on the low, um, but basically we want to, we have three pillars in Code House. Um, it's exposure, so Tech Exposure Day kind of uh, reels that one in. Then there's support and community, right? So we still have a completed chapter on campus that students are a part of and trying to you know, make sure that they are getting the best out of their experience at their um, in the AUC. And we want to expand that to other HBCUs as well. But obviously that's on hold right now a little bit because of the pandemic. Now in terms of support, like my mindset is like, cool. We're exposing students to tech. They're excited. They want to come to HBCUs, but like how do we actually provide them with tangible support, right? I'm all about tangibles, like, ha like exposure is one thing. Sometimes I kind of see it as smoke and mirrors, but how do we actually like if this student wants to come in to come to Google and go to Morehouse? Like, how can I get um, get them there? And so that's why we're doing a scholars initiative and what we're funding for right now to get um, student scholarships um, and a summer academy as well as a mentorship program where they'll get paired up with collegiate mentors as a like big brother big sister program, but then also um, corporate mentors as well. So someone that's professional and can guide them through that professional um, matriculation into a career in tech. So that's kind of what we're working on on the side, like the side hustle, the side hustle, but hopefully more information comes out soon and we will announce it coming up. Okay, no, that sounds great. I mean, it sounds like you've been a really busy man lately. So no, that really does sound great. Um, I mean, so like we touched on in your introduction that you're a software engineer at Google. Um, obviously that and Codehouse have the opportunity to work hand in hand um, with your um, your previous um, experience in tech. Can you just touch on a little bit how you've been able to leverage your positions and opportunities at Google to um, sort of benefit and um, provide more opportunities for Codehouse? Yeah, um, I would say like, you definitely gotta be careful, you know? Like I have never taken any money or donations or anything from Google like outright. There have been Googlers who contributed to Codehouse, which I'm very, appreciative of but um you got to be careful because you know your, your employer shouldn't be also paying you for your side also people do it i know people who have done it i know people who do not look like me who have done it so i just you know don't always have the same um <laughs> uh what's the word benefits uh, all the time but there's definitely been a lot of credibility that was given to me because i'm a software engineer at google right who else is best to tell or help expose students of color to tech than a, a black man in at Google, right? Uh, the only one other person I'll argue would be a black woman at, at Microsoft. Like I'm talking about my sister right now, but she's actually a professor at Spelman uh, currently. Um, but, you know, uh, so when I go and talk to all these other companies, it's like, yeah, this is what I'm doing on the side, but full time I'm a software engineer at Google. That gives me a certain level of credibility. So they're like, oh, he's not BSing. Like he knows what he's talking about. Um, and then I talk about like all my experiences doing talks to these students and trying to get them engaged in, in tech and computer science and they, they're sold, right? So like talking about my story has really benefited me and really helped us raise like money and uh, funds because they just know that 
myself and the rest of my team are the right people for the job because we live that experience and have been through this pathway. Yeah, no, that's great. And it sounds like you have a very um, Spartan, talented family as well with your sister being both at Microsoft and a professor at Spelman too. I know y'all had a lot of interesting conversations growing up. <laughs> we um, we actually, I just moved back to Atlanta. Um, we bought a house together right around the corner from the AUC. Oh, wow. Uh, great. Congrats on that. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Yeah. Um, be careful living with your siblings. <laughs> I'll be very uh, upfront about that. I love her. So the day I die. Um, <laughs> no, I can so imagine. Her, yeah. <laughs> so um, with this past summer, um, sort of racial inequality has been a big focal point within the U.S. And it seems like diversity and inclusion has sort of became like a buzzword at some of these big corporations. Um, have you noticed a lot of more traction from some of these bigger companies and wanting to work with Codehouse um, over the past couple of months? Or have you seen this as an opportunity to sort of leverage the current social climate to um, like just attract more big name corporations to Codehouse? For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, I will tell you, I probably wouldn't have been pitching the Scholars Initiative unless everything else was going on. Because traditionally, through companies being like, that's cool. Good luck with that. You know, like you want a thousand dollars, you want ten thousand. Well, we can do that maybe, but like the numbers I'm asking for, I don't think that would have been um, even a possibility. <laughs> um, and so, like, it's it's interesting to see how it's all playing out and how receptive companies are getting because of everything going on. Um, that being said, like, it's you still got to be careful with like who we, who you're partnering with, right? And then at the end of the day, like if you don't want to just be taking money from anyone just because they're handing you a check, you definitely still want to think about your own um, stance and make sure that you stand up for yourself and not just take, I don't want to say easy money, but like, you know, it's easy money from companies that are just doing it to put on a show. So that's something I'm like, we're definitely mindful about. Um, and so far, like all the people that I've worked with so far, like, they have been great advocates for us and have believed in the vision for, for a while. And I've definitely appreciated all of them. Um, and more importantly, like company aside, the individuals that are at these companies are all trying to do like impactful work. So I think that's what I was talking about earlier about the network, like everyone that I'm meeting, they're just doing so much amazing things. And since they're willing to collaborate with us, like that's allowed us to expand like tenfold. So um, definitely take advantage of everything going on uh, and rightfully so. And I'll say that like as explicit as possible because at the end of the day, anything that I'm bringing into Code House, we're just trying to get back to students. So I don't feel too bad about <laughs> taking advantage of the situation right now. I mean, right, rightfully as you should. <laughs> but now I wanted to shift a little bit on to asking more questions around Google. Um, so during your time at Morehouse, you had the opportunity to intern um, every summer at Google, which is a huge accomplishment in itself. Um, so can you sort of speak on how you're able to secure an internship like that so early in your college career? And what about Google kept you interested in returning to the company um, every summer as well? Yeah, it's called the Morehouse Finesse, you know? Um, <laughs> kidding, of course. I mean, when I first got to Morehouse, I heard about the Google internship and I was like, I need that. Like, that's what my goal for the year. Like, I need to get the inter internship. And I did everything possible to make sure that my application was like top tier shape. I was fortunate enough to have computer science in high school. So I started my junior year. Um, my first ever black teacher in my life, um, Ms. Connery was uh, my computer science teacher. And she was like, you know, my guiding light. So when I got to Morehouse, like I had already previous knowledge, like I already did pretty much like introduction to computer science and a little bit of programming one in high school. So I started tutoring students on the side with my friend and like won the hackathon with my sister because she was at Spelman at the time still. And like, you know, started doing research in the computer science lab and my application was just being built out. And the, the biggest thing was having a good relationship with the recruiters on campus, right? They're literally there to vouch for you and they want to see you succeed. Like no, no matter what other, what company it is, like they're there for, for you. And they see you and they see your energy and they see your enthusiasm. They're going to be like, okay, we need to highlight, we need to make sure this person gets an internship, get get them to Google or what whatever company. And that's really what happened with me. Um, just because I was always showing my face around and like I was just like <laughs> very active, very talkative on campus and everything. So um 
the other part of it is specifically when it comes to interviewing with Google, you have to have some technical skills, right? Um, I always say it's like 70% personal branding, 30% technical, um, tech, te technical knowledge, because at the end of the day, you communicate your thoughts clearly and concisely, like people who are interviewing you are going to be like, I don't even know what this kid is saying. Like, all right, maybe next year. Right. Um, the technical interview is a beast within itself, but if you can really show your personality and really communicate very well and are um, articulate, I can't even say that right now. I'm trying to say articulate, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, speak very clearly. Uh, you that those are the candidates that they want to see um, succeed and push through to the next rounds. So my two biggest pieces of advice is really show that confidence, show that you're confident in yourself, even if you're nervous and anxious on the inside. That's when you got to turn it on. And, you know, you need to become another person. I did theater growing up, so it's like very easy for me to get into character and like be like, hey, how are you doing? My name is Ernest Holmes. You know, I'll be making jokes in interviews. I'll be showing them my personality. So confidence and personality goes a long way in, in, in the interview. Um, and the second thing is just, you know, backing it up with your credentials. Talk about previous experiences. Talk about um, specifically when you're talking about software engineering, talking about previous experiences that relate to um, technical solutions that you created in the past, like goes so far, especially when interviewing full time. That's all I did. And for most part, like there was like three companies. I didn't have to do any technical coding challenges or anything because they're just like, oh, he has all this experience at Google and like NASA and stuff they're like okay yeah no he, he'll be fine right but that's just because i was talking you know <laughs> talking a lot <laughs> so um but yeah confidence personal branding and sh showcasing your personality through an interview is so 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 important no that's great advice no I definitely say um morehouse teaches you a little bit <laughs> of each of those just as you matriculate through the college so um i imagine everybody on this call can get a little bit of that as they um just reach graduation no but thank you so much for that advice as well Definitely. So um, just understanding, I mean, you touched on this earlier and everybody sort of understands that the tech industry is a predominantly um, white industry. And mm -hmm. coming from an undergraduate school of Morehouse where most of the people you're surrounded by look like you and me, can you just touch on how the transition was from going from a HBCU in Morehouse to a um, Google um, where it's a predominantly white environment? The first thing that they talk about with you at Google when you go into the orientation process is imposter syndrome. Um, if you guys haven't heard that term before, imposter syndrome is a feeling of not feeling belong at, in whatever situation you're in. And truly, you know, I was sitting there and I was like looking around MIT, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, Duke, um, and I was just like, wow, why am I here right now? Like, how did I get here, right? And of course, there's a few more houses um students a few howard and a few other hbcus were there i don't think any spelman or clark were there that year um but everyone else all those other schools i was listening were not black students right so it was like when they were up on stage talking about imposter syndrome they were like yeah you want to feel like you you slipped through the cracks and you got here somehow i was like yep that's me that you're literally talking to me right now um and but they they make a very big point about like you didn't get here by accident nothing happens on accident you're here for a reason you showed your skills and like you belong here right um and it that didn't really sink in with me until maybe my second internship because even after i got finished the first one i got the return offer and i was still like i don't know how i did that right but i realized that even with everyone around you being very smart and you think everyone around you is a genius you're you're your own genius in your own um, regarding your own um, perspective, right? There are things that I knew how to do that just other interns, no matter what school they went to or other people on my team even, like they just didn't know how to do. Um, and it, it could be different things, whether it's speaking, whether it's confidence. I remember one time my freshman, my first internship, it was like a meeting with my entire team and they were talking about something and I like, I spoke up and I asked a question and my uh, partner, cause you get a partner with the first internship. She was like, oh wow, like, how, you were brave enough to ask a question. I was like, I didn't care. Like, you know, I was curious. I was going to ask a question. You know, I want people to know that I'm in the room as well. And I'm cur curious about the um, the problem that they're trying to solve. And, you know, that just showed me that, like, just because people have some other credentials that you don't have or had other experiences that you don't have, you need to sometimes take um, and look at yourself and realize what 
what you bring to the table and that's unique right and um <laughs> yeah I, I would say Morehouse prepared me so well for the internships um in regards to just believing in myself and knowing that I have to always work twice as hard twice as smart twice as fast um in order to prove myself but now that I just finished my first year at Google and stuff I'm like all right you know uh just because they went to these big name schools does not mean that they're it <laughs> you know uh, just because they're from certain areas or had certain backgrounds it does not mean anything different at the end of the day results show everything mm -hmm. if you can produce the results no one can say anything different to you yeah no, that's 100 percent true and um i mean that's that's amazing that google would just um acknowledge the imposter syndrome that a lot of people do face um just right off the bat so i definitely do applaud google for um one admitting that we were acknowledging that and um, i mean because that's definitely something that we all deal with and face at sometimes for sure i mean you got to look at sometimes like they talk about the numbers of getting a full-time offer at google it's like this 0 0.02 percent or something to get like 2.5 million applications a year and like except maybe a hundred what was it 26,000 I think that's what they said something like that a wow. year um so it's like crazy odds but I that's why I always advocate specifically through Code House as well for students to consider HBCUs because that is a foot in the door right not all these institutions have Googlers come to campus all the time have a Google engineer be a professor for a semester um, so we have a foot in the door. I'll just be very blunt about that. And I say that all the time, right? So whether you step through that door and you stand and you make your presence known or you just avoid those opportunities, like <laughs> you could do that too. But, you, you know, Morehouse Fellman, like all these HBCUs have, are getting a lot of foot, feet indoors because of everything that's going on in the world. Um, and I think we need to take full advantage of it. And there's definitely a lot of HBCU alums that have been fighting for their companies to come back and recruit at these institutions. So it's not an accident, you know, it's not like, oh, well, people are dying in the streets. Let's go interview and like go to Morehouse or Spelman or Clark. Um, it's been people fighting for it for a while. And then like, it took me a little while to realize that as well. So um, it, it's cool to see things starting to change, but there's so much more work that needs to be done. Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, but I'm happy. It seems like the right people are working on making that change. So I'm definitely happy or excited about the future and what it has to hold. For sure. So yeah, I just have one more question before I um, pass it off and open it up to the crowd to um, ask any questions that you may have. But you touched on this a little bit earlier in our conversation, and that's just um, balancing both your full-time job at Google and while still um, managing like um, your part-time job in Codehouse as well. Can you just speak on how you balance both and um, just what that process is like? Um, <laughs> it's terrible because like I just don't sleep, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was just to be blunt. I I've always been in an overachieving family. Like my obviously my sister um, is a, a testament to that. My parents were very overachievers as well. Um, and you know when I set out to achieve a goal, like I'm going to achieve it, whether you know it's lack of sleep or whatever. I don't advocate for that at all. By the way, don't do it. Um, <laughs> but that being said, like um, I'm just so passionate about the code house stuff that I'm like willing to put the extra hours on the weekend hours on to to do so. And um, of course, Google is still like a special place in my heart. And like, I'm, I need to get I need to get paid. So I need to do my job as well. Right. So you you figure it out. Um, time management, obviously, is just very key. I live by my Google calendar. I live by Calendly. Like I tell anyone like, literally one of my profiles. I love him. He's my special like that, that's my ride or die. He wanted to talk with me and I kept on like, dismissing him. So he had to put time on my calendar and then that's how we met. I'll just be straight up. And it, like, and it worked out because I was just like, I just have so many different meetings, whether it's Code House or Google, that it's just like, it just helps me mentally organize better. <laughs> um, I'm not a robot or anything to say that, but just like during the weekdays, it's just like so hard. But also balancing it with a personal life. I'm like very strong about Fridays and Saturdays if I want to go out. Well, not anymore because COVID, but, you know, just relax, just not focus on anything work related. Like that's what I do. Um, unless something really is like important to get done on that weekend, like to have a big event coming up or something. Like I make sure like whether it's playing video games, like you should be going out, going out or whatever. Um, I make sure Fridays and Saturdays are online. I did that in college as well. Like Sundays, study, study, study. Monday through Thursday, study, study, study. Th Fridays and Saturdays was, was my time. 
well, I guess it's all my time, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And that's definitely necessary to be able to block out just like that personal type of mental health days that everyone needs um, to sort of just bounce back and be themselves. So no, no, that's definitely great. Um, yeah, so now I'd love to open this conversation up to the audience. If anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and um, ask the questions you have. Uh, yeah, I don't want to mess up your name, but is it Odin Creepy? Yes, it's Odin Creepy White. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes, for speaking with us. I really enjoyed the conversation. I was taking a whole lot of notes. Um, my name is Odin Creepy White. I'm a freshman psychology major. And my question, I have two questions. My first one is just a clarification. So you said you use Google Calendar and what else? Just so to make sure people are like. It's Cal Calendly. Calendly. So like, Der Calendly um, allows you to like put people can put meetings on your calendar uh, with that link, and you so you can control if it's like fifteen minute, an hour minute, or hour long um, meeting, and it actually looks at your calendar to tell people like, oh, he's busy at from three to five, but he has an opening at five thirty or something like that. Oh wow, that's yeah. and it's connected to to your Google Calendar. Yeah. Yeah, um, or if you use Apple Calendar, I think it connects to that too. This is like a pitch. I should get them to sponsor GoDance by this point. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's so great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Freshman year, okay. What, what hall? What dorm? I think I was supposed to be in Robert Hall. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I forget. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, Robert. I stayed in Robert. I was a Graves Hall freshman year for me. Um, so cool, cool, cool. Are you doing your freshman year? I don't know if this is not me supposed to ask you questions, but. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. I think I'm actually kind of grateful. Oh, yeah. Shout out, uh, Joshua. I was actually going to be in Graves, too, I think, because I'm in the honors program. Cool. But, cool. Um, yeah, so far, it's been good. You know, starting off, like, online, it was an adjustment at first, but I've kind, kind of gotten used to it. And cool. uh, I feel like I'm definitely learning more than just, like, trying to get a good grade. And also, like, great opportunities like this. Um the MBA has been really helpful, uh, just That's stuff fun. like that. So I feel supported and I feel like I'm learning a lot. Cool. Well, love it. Yeah. Great. My, I'm sorry, go ahead. You got it. Oh, thank you. And then my other question was, um, so given uh, the, the shift that com companies are taking now in regards to uh, the racial injustices, what are some ways that you kind of push them or present of different numbers or to be more active? So I would even say before everything that happened, I remember I got invited to talk with like the chief diversity officer at Dell. Um, and they wanted, Dell wanted to come in and talk to some students who were like doing well about well, how they can get more AC students to Dell. And it's like weird free dinner though so why not go right always go to free free food places um or opportunities and i was just very adamant about how some companies came in to to the uc post flyers and saying like attention all morehouse university students come to floor 225 and it's like like you don't have even have the decency to know it's morehouse college versus morehouse university but you want morehouse students to come to your company like how does that make any sense right and so I was just very clear and adamant about the fact that if you want your company to really support and bring in more diverse talent from these institutions, you need to get involved in their community, see what pitfalls they have and how you can help fix them, right? There's no reason that Dell wants to recruit a bunch of, and they're very open to this. So like, I, like, I really like Dell. Dell has supported us for um, the last two events as well. So like, um, so, and I would really appreciate them coming in on campus to say, um, to have this conversation, but there's no reason that like a company like Dell comes to campus and like sees the classrooms and sees like these old funky computers, right? And not be like, oh, let's provide more house with X amount of computers or um, you know, something else that they can um, help the students or the school out with. And I was just very, like, very strong about that. And that's how they were willing to hear me pitch Code House to them for the very first event. And they were actually the first company to give us money for, for the event. Um, so I, I know that was before everything that's happening, but even now, like I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with my VP for context, like your VP 
his skip manager is the CEO of Google, which is like insane, right? This guy like worked right under Steve Jobs and was like getting harassed by him back in the day um, before Apple was really Apple and like all this stuff. So he's, he's been around for a while. And I told him like, he was asking me like, like straight up, like how can we, how can we help the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff? And I was like, I don't have an answer to you. I said, what we'll say is, I'm glad that you're talking about it now, but a few months ago, back in February, when like it was Black History Month, y'all didn't say anything, like not even happy, happy, happy Black History Month or anything. I was like, so I appreciate you. I'm glad you're an ally now. You want to support the movement, but like it needs to remain consistent. This shouldn't be something that falls off in a few months and then you're like, oh wow. And like, and then something else happens like, oh wow, we still don't have any Black people on my team. My team is 600 people and there's five of us that I know are Black which is like 600 people at Google was a small team, by the way, like it's not huge. It's people in California, New York and Australia. And like out of all those places and like um, everyone on that team, there's like five that I've counted, you know? And I told him straight up, I was like, I'm not jealous of your job right now because it's, it's a hard thing to figure out. But at the end of the day, you need to support the black community by bringing more black people on the team. Figure that out, that's your job. <laughs> so that's not my job, you know? Um, and that's another thing that I'll just let you guys know. Companies will try to have you be the black spokesperson. If you're not comfortable with that, don't do it. Like no one's making you do it. The black community will not be mad at you for not standing up for your people because it's tiring. It, it's definitely tiring. Um, I'm more talkative, so I'm willing to do so. So I don't know if that answered your question. But <laughs> those are my experiences with everything going on. No, I did. Thank you. No worries. Oh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Greg, would you like to ask your question? Um, yes, thank you. So, hello, Mr. Holmes. My name is Gregory Aristude. I'm a business administration major from Flowery Branch, Georgia. And I had uh, two questions. And my first question was, were you always interested in software engineering? Has that been something that you've always wanted to do? Or like, when, when did that interest in becoming a software engineer first pop up? For sure. Um, I would say, my junior year, when I first found out what coding was, I was like, oh my God, like, this is amazing. I can make, literally, you can make anything that you put your mind to, which I think is like the dopest concept ever, right? If I wanted to make an app that like tracks where the closest bathroom is, I can do that, right? I don't know why I was the first thing that came to my head, but <laughs> you know, you can literally do anything that you put your mind to. And I think that's such a dope concept. Um, now that I have had a lot more experience, I'm still in love with software engineering. I still love the idea of creating products. I'm just trying to hone in how I can mesh that passion with what I want to do like in life, like whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's social impact with Code House, like still trying to figure that out. My team is really cool. We're learning a lot of cool things. We're making literally making an operating system from scratch. Anyone that's in the tech space, um, quick uh, lesson. All operating systems are all stemmed from the same thing called Linux, right? Whether it's Windows, whether it's Mac, whether it's your iPhone, everything is Linux based. We're making our operating system that's not Linux based, um, which is like a crazy thing to do. And it's really cool to see like something that's such, so cutting edge and like being on a team like that. Um, but it's also something I'm not in love with, right? That's not what I imagined myself doing for the rest of my life. Um, I'm learning so much, which, so it's really cool. And especially, it's cool to see business decisions and how they are moving forward with with creating this this product. And it's also kind of secretive, so don't tell anyone I told you all that. But <laughs> um, that that's that's what I work on. But so I'm still in love with software engineering. I guess it started in high school. I think still think it's a great thing to pick up and learn, uh, especially if you want to make a lot of money out of undergrad. Like you know, do it for a few years and every company is going to want you for the rest of your life, no matter what industry you go into, no matter what you do. Like if you have some software engineering schools, some um, understanding of um, fundamental concepts of computer science, you're going to be so marketable for yourself. So always keep that in the back of your head. And uh, my second question was, uh, do you think you could just talk about your matriculation throughout Morehouse and, you know, any classes that may have uh, posed a struggle as you were on your journey? For sure. Um, so <laughs> I was always like an AP honor student in high school. So I got in, I was trying to do the same thing, right? Um, started off just a computer science major, considering getting a math minor. 
my sister super smart she finished Spelman in three years so I literally being petty put on a second major so I could get two degrees in four years it was like a joke um I don't know if that was the best decision because like I said Fridays Fridays and Saturdays I loved going out and um doing my thing but you know having two majors it was not the easiest <laughs> so like I definitely had to balance that and then of course I was very active on campus I was a presidential ambassador obviously I'm an alpha like um just always doing different talks like in speaking engagements of course as well and um it was a, you know it, I think it's really important to be busy on campus right um and busy can mean a bunch of things whether that's in your own regards doing your own products or projects and, and your own hustles whether that's focusing in school and your academics but or being very engaged on campus whether you join like CASA or Pulse or what have you like or a Greek organization um, it's important to find a few things that you can call your own and can give you a sense of identity um, so especially like underclassmen make sure that you try out a bunch of different things but don't stress yourself out because you're gonna want to try everything and then you're gonna get overwhelmed for sure um, at the end of the day, your grades speak volumes. Companies like Google don't care about your DPA, but I always say if you have a strong academic background, that shows the kind of person that you are, right? Because you're focused in your primary, what you should be in school, which is which are your grades, right? Uh, you have a certain work ethic about yourself. That also being said, if you have a 3.0 or 2.7, like doesn't mean it's in the world, it's not, you know, sometimes some people just learn or um, have different strengths. But if you have, I would always say like, no matter who you are, if you have at least a 3.3, I would say shoot, of course always shoot for 4.0, but if you have at least a 3.3, you'll be fine. Uh, 3.2, 3.1, it's not that new world either. Um, but of course above 3.0, make sure you maintain that. Um, that's a roundabout way to say I was involved a lot. I did a lot of different things on campus. Uh, I feel like it was just always different things going on you know and like to a point where I got like I was one of the students that got highlighted in my senior year for like the senior scholars or what I forget what they called it so but they did like a bio on me or, or whatever and then I, it was really cool because I was the Robert Smith class so they used me for like CNN and like MSNBC and ABC so that, that was cool as well um, so I oh and you know that's just reflective of like me always being involved always just opened up more doors for opportunities so get involved I think that was that that message Thank you. You know, I'll, I'll add one more thing, Gregory. Uh, that's my dad's name, so weird thing to say. Uh, but um, like I was saying with the, the, the grades, there's gonna be some times, like I always talk about your finesse, right? So I brought up Morehouse finesse earlier and that's how I got Google, but there's a finesse to everything. There's finesse to every club, there's a finesse to every organization, there's a finesse to every class, right? But sometimes the finesse, whether it's, you know, talking to upperclassmen, getting the old tests and setting off those old tests, right? We've all done it. Um, sometimes the finesse is really just going to Woody or going to your, to your room and studying for, for a few days, right? Um, one of my math courses, um, real analysis was terrible. If any math majors out there, good luck to you. Uh, I didn't like it at least, so that was not my thing. Uh, but real analysis was <laughs> writing proofs that covered literally long whiteboards for days and I it was just really hard it was really hard for me like I got my first test back and I got like a D or F or something and I was like wow okay I need to study my finesse for that class was literally going to Woody library and studying for weekends you know so those Friday Fridays and Saturdays I had to be in the morning in Woody because that was my finesse for that class so finessing doesn't always mean like cutting corners or just you know, cheating or scamming or whatever, like it could literally just mean figuring out what's the optimal solution for whatever problem you're facing. That was a technical way of saying, just like figuring out a solution for that, for the problem you're facing, right? So I will always like to tell my classmen that um, to make sure they figure out what the finesse is for each of their classes or whatever they're trying to do. Yeah, uh, that's definitely some great advice. And um, I, I can definitely understand now all you're saying you couldn't get or you don't get any sleep <laughs> there's only 24 hours in a day and it seems like you are an extremely busy man <laughs> but i can definitely <laughs> understand that <laughs> Sorry, um, good. Sorry, good. <laughs> josh would you like to ask your question yeah 
Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I've enjoyed this conversation so far. My name is Joshua Salmon. I'm a freshman business administration major from Tampa, Florida. Um, here at Morehouse, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to be a Bonner Scholar. Um, and through that, this program, uh, we serve kids um, through tutoring and kind of mentorship, really, um, especially in this virtual platform. Even though we haven't met them, you know, face to face, because they're at home learning, we're like one of the only people that they really get to see during their week um, outside of their teachers. Um, with that being said, the community, so I serve with a program called Raising Expectations, and um, the community they serve, of course, is in Atlanta. Um, I guess my question is, so I've heard a lot of different conversations through interviews and different talks about the idea of trying to help kids from when they're young to expand, especially Black kids, to uh, expand their mind concerning what their future can look like outside of just, you know, the typical sports and, you know, being a rapper, which, of course, is if that's what you're passionate for, go for it. But expanding their minds outside of that. So, you know, you sometimes may have heard people say the idea of, oh, you see that kid who plays video games? Empower him to, you know, get into designing video games and different stuff like that. I guess my question is, how would you encourage uh, tangibly doing that? Because while, you know, you can say, hey, why not be a graphic designer? They now go and do the research and it sounds like a lot of work. Um, especially when you don't see a lot of examples around you of people actually effectively doing that um, at a young age, at least. So I know that, you know, Code House is giving that opportunity, but right now, being that we're in this, uh, this virtual platform where people are less motivated, even as a college student, I'm less motivated to do the work. How would you suggest, you know, motivating younger kids to pursue, uh, not even just in the coding realm, but with that as well, but just even, you know, beyond just the usual that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I was, I'm going to start off with saying like, naturally, this is not just for kids, but like people my age, people a lot older than me, like everyone is lazy, right? At the end, at the end of the day, right? Like people want um, maximum results with little input, right? Um, so if you have a student who wants to do graphic design, for instance, right? find them that graphic design course so that they can go and, and start taking it. And if you're really like that dedicated to that student, you're gonna be a great mentor to make sure that they're setting milestones for themselves. So like in a week, I wanna see a brand new logo design for yourself, like the Ernest Holmes logo or whatever. And week two, I wanna see you redesign McDonald's logo, right? And using Adobe Photoshop or, or whatever, whatever it is. <clears throat> the programs like that is what I, love the best because that's tangible things that students can learn and you can see tangible tangible results from it right so now not only is a student learning and developing skills but then they also have something that they can reflect on and be like wow i built these things out so we can talk about like computer science for instance right like i point people especially like people who are going through technical interviews i give them links to like the websites of course like hacker rank and leak code um, to make sure that they are practicing interview questions from those websites, right? Rather than me going like, hey man, make sure that you're um, practicing those interview questions. Great, cool, see you later, right? So I'll, t I'll tell them, do these um, interview questions for at least a week, try doing it, you know, try to give them a schedule as well, right? The, and the, this is where I'm, I started off with saying like people are lazy uh, by nature. The more that you give them and the more like guidance that you give them an outline the curriculum, a, a structure, the more that they're like, okay, like I know like, okay, I need to commit at least one hour to this a week. I need to commit two hours of this a week. And kids are so like, it's funny because they, they, they just need some guidance sometimes, right? So the more structure you can give them, that's why like traditionally classes are like, you know, you have first period from this time to this time, you have lunch right at this time because um, they need that structure sometimes in order to um, pursue or accomplish some goals that they wouldn't normally if they get, had an open schedule. Of course, you need to balance it out. Like, you don't want to go, like, full, um, <laughs> like, prison, like, uh, a schedule on them. But um, giving that guidance and make sure that you check in on them because sometimes students just won't check in on, on with you. And that's something I need to work on better myself with students that I'm trying to help out. Um, but talking, giving that interview example again, I would also host mock interviews for those students. I say, like, okay, have you done at least 10 problems on Hack Rank or – or we code cool you have an interview with me and we could do it face to face or um through the video camera and that's actually also helping them make sure that they're staying on it because like if you didn't do 10 interviews by the next time we talk like i can't even give you that mock interview which is just going to help you even more right 
So you put little things like in place for them like that and like, dang, I need to get these 10 done. You know, maybe they wouldn't be five. They're like, listen, I did five, but um, you know, I did them very strongly. I'm so sorry, but this is what I have. And like, I think I feel good to do an interview with you. And then I'll be like, okay, you know, I'm glad you're honest with me. Let's do it. Uh, but at, at what I'm trying to say is just structure, organization, people are lazy. So the more you can give them, <laughs> the more that they will accomplish for sure. Uh, do you mind if I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, so hearing you speak, um, I also heard you speak on your sister and I don't know your family structure, uh, but I, uh, working with the kids, a lot of times their parents are working a lot, especially right now. Um, my question to you is, I guess, what did your family do or how did you develop in yourself that drive um, a lot of the kids, you know, they have dreams, and aspirations, but a lot of their families are looking for things that seem easy to obtain. So, you know, just go into uh, certain fields that they know they can achieve. That makes sense. So how would you, in, a lot of times we work with the parents and we speak to them um, and just, you know, usually it's concerning their uh, schoolwork and stuff like that. But how would you say to speak to parents um, concerning seeing bigger for their children beyond what seems tangible, if that makes sense? Are you still asking me, how do I set expectations like, for the parents? Well, in a sense, like, so a lot of the parents that I've spoken to, uh, they have their children in raising expectations because of the fact that they themselves um, only achieve so much and they want to see their kids achieve uh, bigger and better. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, me as a student, I'm a freshman, so I'm still trying to figure out stuff myself, but they're asking me like, how do I get my kid? How do I help my kid to see bigger? What should I be doing? So I guess, what did your parents maybe do? I know, you know coming to Morehouse is a step in itself, but what did your parents do to kind of empower you to, see further than just medi mediocrity <laughs> my dad was on this call you'd be laughing um my dad's from maryland my mom is actually um born and raised in panama uh, so she came here at a young age and like went to, to go to college uh she was the auditor auditor for the state of texas for like 30 years my dad would practice law in manhattan so they did a lot on top of them doing a lot they ran a family photography business so like they would go from their nine to fives come home and take like whether it was musicals or football games, whatever the case is, they, they did like a whole photography business on the side. So I, I grew up watching all this, right? Um, parents trying to raise us while doing day jobs, while having a side hustle. Like you can kind of see where I get it from now, uh, hearing all of that. Um, but my dad always had something with me where he would always tell me to kick it up a notch. Like that was like the one phrase if I had to hear my dad say one thing, that's what he always said, kick, kick it up a notch, kick it up a notch. And no matter how well I was doing, if I got straight A's, kick it up a notch because you know you could always do better, right? And it wasn't to any, like, not to, like, um, diminish my accomplishments or anything like that. Um, it was just to always know that, like, now that you got to this level, you can always push yourself to keep going and keep going. And it got to the point where, it, like, eventually, you know, I graduated, like, Phi Beta Kappa, Magnum Cum Laude, and, like, all that. My dad, that's what he says now. He doesn't tell me kick it up a notch anymore because he's like, you're doing the thing. I have nothing else to give you like you're doing you're doing it right um and, and along the way he always like you know was very happy with my accomplishments so it wasn't just like oh you just you could always do better um but that being said like when talking to parents you need to talk from your own experiences right like you can't tell them how to get a job at google because you haven't gotten a job at google yourself right but you could tell uh, the parents how to get into college right what you did right because you you went through it you literally just went through it Last year, were you a freshman? Sophomore. I'm a freshman. Freshman, right? So literally last year, right? So um, helping, what I always do is like, I try to, any student or parent that asks me for advice and like my matriculation, like I try to put them in my footsteps um, going through going through everything that I went through, right? So sharing my successes, my failures. Um, but obviously I can't tell them how to become the next CEO of Google because I, I, I haven't done that, right? But if a student wants to have a great application to get into Morehouse, I got them. Like, you know, I add this to your resume, add this into your personal statement, whatever. Um, and then once you get to Morehouse, we can talk from there. Oh, you want to go and go into entrepreneurship? I have these brothers in this sector, these brothers in this sector that can help you and talk to you about that, right? So, um, I don't really know if I have any like strict advice on how to talk to parents about it, but um, I think like you don't put all the weight on yourself <laughs> to make sure that these students become the next astronauts or, you know, presidents of the world. Um, 
I always encourage it, but help them get to where you are and while you still focus on your own your own growth and matriculation yourself. You know? I don't know if that helped, man, but <laughs> good I luck with that. Did. It definitely did. It definitely did. Thank you. For sure. No worries. Yeah, no. Great response to that. Now, I currently don't see any more questions queued um, in the chat. Does anyone else want to ask anything else before we wrap this conversation up? Yeah, I got a question real quick. Um, so, hello, everybody. My name is Rashad Townsend. I'm a junior econ major, Black Studies minor from Nashville. Um, I really appreciated your talk, Ernest, and especially um, just seeing you at such a young age, really, like, tapping into, like, you know, your talents to invest in the community. I feel like Morehouse does a great job of telling you how to get a job and telling you how to get to corporate America, but they, you know, I feel like we fall really short on that reaching back point. So, um, I do want to commend you everything you're doing um the question i have is you know you talked about earlier all the things you were involved in uh on campus and i think at least something i'm learning now is like um uh it's like yes it's great to do things on campus that like you love but it also kind of teaches you you know life lessons and like things to do in the workplace that are almost like directly relatable so i kind of wanted to hear like some of your experiences like is there something you did, you know, whether it was with Greek life or with Code House or with um, uh, presidential ambassadors that really prepared you for stuff that you faced in the workplace? Great question. Um, I immediately think of two takeaways, which I kind of touched on already, so I don't want to be too redundant. But the first thing is always like your network, right? Um, I always take people through the trip or the talk, the saying that like, the first thing you always hear, right, is your network is your net worth, right? Um, people say that all the time. Uh, that's true, but to some degrees, it's not true. Um, I take it a step further and say, like, it's not uh, who it's not who you know, but it's, it's who you, who knows you, right? So who, people who, who who can talk about you, like, oh yeah, I know Ernest, like um, he's uh, Alpha at Morehouse or whatever, right? That's also cool, but that's still not it, really. It's who knows you and who can speak well on your behalf. And that's one thing I think I personally did well while I was at Morehouse was able to have such a, I'm gassing myself up, but like having a strong personal brand that like allowed other people to be like, oh, Ernest, he's a sharp kid. He's been at Google, he, Codehouse, Alpha, whatever. So that like, if he vouches for some, somebody or something, like I had to vouch for, for that same thing. Um, and that's a really the position that I always encourage younger students to get into because um, that's how you get the opportunities that change your life or like can open so many more doors than you can even expect. So taking leadership positions like president of MBA or uh, joining Greek organization, that's cool too, you know, that's the whole other, other thing. But um, you start building your personal branding like resume like that people are like will know you from people who know me well especially while i was on campus all knew me as that kid who was at google for that summer right he's a computer science kid he's like what not kid but you know student morehouse man uh uh and now the people all know me as the googler who was also doing a, a nonprofit on the side that's inspiring students across the nation right uh so i'm just very proud of my personal brand and um other people are willing to advocate me for me because I've seen the work and the tangible results that I've, I've, I've given. So that's like the first thing that I've learned with doing everything that I'm doing. Um, the second thing, I, I wanted to go off on the tangent of like of, you need to figure out what works for you, right? I'm telling you everything that I did. Um, I, I think I had a successful, successful career while at Morehouse, but that's, you know, like I said, sometimes if it was, <laughs> I just did not get sleep. Or, you know, I um, I never let my grades fall, but like sometimes, you know, my grades slipped a little bit um, or I was just like over burnt out because I was just doing so much, right? But that worked in, in quotes for me. So you need to figure out what works for you. Um, and sometimes it's hard for me to give advice to people because I want them to be like me and burn themselves out and do so much and always active on campus and doing a thousand things at the same time, but that is not what works for, for everyone. Uh, I, I'll tell you guys right now, my friend group from freshman year from Graves Hall, they're still my best friends to this day. Literally, like, friend is going through some life stuff, uh, hit the group chat, we were all on FaceTime within five minutes last night. Um, 
and they're all grad school, medical school, and other ones that Google with me, Goldman Sachs, uh, NYU Film School, like doing amazing things, a state trooper. Um, and, you know, we stopped our days to like, to go, go on and talk. And these are people that I can lean on. And I brought them up because like, what makes them go and what makes them successful is very different from what makes me successful, right? Um, and really leaning on your Morehouse brothers, but your AUC family, let alone your HBCU family is so important, especially everything that's going on right now. But being able to really take in your friends almost as mentors yourself and like learning from, from them is something that I personally have benefited from. Um, just because, like I said, what makes me go to is not the same thing that makes them go. And I've learned a lot from seeing how they manage different situations or just handle their business. So um, Morehouse Brothers Brotherhood is so real to this day. Uh, and I'll, you know, like I said, for the Scholars Initiative, you, you guys will see how, how real it is and hopefully in a few months. Um, but definitely lean on those other brothers and sisters from Spelman and Clark and the other HBCUs as well, because you will learn a lot from seeing how other people are succeeding and failing around you. And don't be scared to share your own experiences and whether you succeed or fail too. I don't know if that helped as well, but I hope it <laughs> did something. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, bro. No problem, man. Yeah, no, you've definitely dropped a lot of great gems and advice throughout this conversation, Ernest. And um, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day, your very busy day. Just hop on this call and have this conversation with us. Um, I, I know that everyone walked away um, with a lot of takeaways from this. So again, thank you for your time today. And I'm no problem. No problem. If y'all ever need anything, hit me up on LinkedIn. If I don't connect or respond, hit me up again because I'm terrible on LinkedIn. Even if it's on Instagram, you DM me. That's probably better because that's how I answer. Um, but definitely, y'all need anything. Y'all my family too, so I'm here for you.